Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's Experience Christian Church podcast. I'm your host, uh, Diane Karshner. And with me, as usual, is our senior pastor, Matt Silver. Say hi, Matt. Hey there. How are you? Very good. Very good. I just got back from a little beach vacation, so I am wired up and ready to go. It's sort of like we did a podcast a couple of weeks ago uh, where we actually recorded in the evening and we had to be on caffeine to be able to stay awake. Yeah. That's how I'm feeling today, man. That's how I'm feeling. Yeah, a little wired. And uh, below on the screen, you will see our friend Nathan McDade, who actually delivered our, our passage, our message this, this week. So we're really excited to have him uh, share some more pearls of wisdom and maybe some more catchphrases that we can use during the week. Nathan's been a longtime friend of Matt. Um, and it's now located, where are you and your wife and kids located now, Nathan? We live in Fishers, Indiana, which is kind of a suburb of Indianapolis, basically. Okay. All right. And you guys met, Matt, why don't you tell the story of how you met Nathan? Yeah, we first met at Melton Christian Church. We were both on staff there. And then we were both students at Emmanuel Christian Seminary for a season together. And so we were able to do some classes and hang out there. So, yeah. Then... That's awesome. Probably some really good stories there, too, because there's always stories with Matt. So we'll <laughs> do that offline <laughs> or maybe we'll do it at the end and maybe cut it if it's too bad. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, thanks so much for joining us, Nathan. We really appreciate you taking another hour of your time. Uh, My pleasure. Work. Always, always good to be with you guys. Great. And for those of you who haven't listened to the message, you might want to tune in because we're going to be talking about something very deep to begin with. We're going to be talking about whether you should eat a peach that is juicy or a peach that is firm. <laughs> because Nathan and I are of the belief that you only can eat a peach when it's juicy and the juice is running down your arms. That's a good peach. Makes my mouth water. What about you, Matt? How do you like your peach? Yeah, mushy. I love peaches oh. in a bowl of milk with sugar sprinkled on top. Oh. Oh. Say it, brother. Love it. Whoa. That was always a favorite growing growing up nice so in um in deference to nathan's hugely wonderful analogy about the peach we are calling this podcast be the peach because <laughs> we want to just do this whole christian life the right way right so that's what we're going to dive into our series that we're right in the middle of well actually we're only in the third week of this but it feels like longer. Um, it's only been three weeks, but we're going through the fruit of the spirit in our empowered um, series. So um, if you haven't heard the first two, please go back. And when you have time, you're driving somewhere, tune in your podcast and just listen while you're driving, because we got into some great discussions um, so far. So one of the things that, uh, that I noticed about this series, um, the fruit of the spirit, is that there's something in it for everybody. Sometimes series get so deep and spiritual and theological that you just can't connect. But there's so many levels in the fruit of the spirit that we can all connect to. So let's start there. Um, we referenced over the last couple of weeks, Dr. Philip Kinnison's book, um, Life on the Vine, which really gave such an interesting perspective. But one of the things I want to make sure I get his quote right, he suggested that to cultivate joy in your life, you had to be mindful of the way you start your day. So I'll throw this out to both of you. How do you guys start your day to make sure that, uh, since we're talking about joy this week, to make sure that you're in tune with the joy that God has for you? Give us an idea of what it's like that first 15 minutes of your days. Go ahead, Nathan. Well, uh, first thing I'll say on that is that uh, in my current life now doing chaplaincy. I'm, I'm a PRN hospital chaplain. So PRN is as needed. Medical folks will know that term. And so I work different shifts at different places. Every week is different. Every day is different sometimes, except on my Wednesdays are pretty consistent. That's when I'm doing a corporate chaplaincy thing. But that starts, I get up at like 4.30 on Wednesdays. So all that to say, uh, it's been a real challenge in this new, this current chapter to to have any consistency with how I start my day. But on a good day, uh, when I have uh, the, the av availability and the ability to, you know, when I've got some rest, what, what I like to do, what I try to do most days is start with some solitude and silence. Um, just even if it's just five minutes 
of just being alone, being quiet before I start saying any words in prayer, before I start making coffee, before I start reading the Bible, before I start doing anything, just to sit quietly. Sometimes I light a candle. Uh, it's a tradition I picked up from some different folks I've uh, been around to just kind of welcome the Holy Spirit's presence and just be quiet for just even a, just a few minutes. And then when I, when I have a, a little bit of margin at the beginning of the day, like I try to, then I like to just spend a little time reading the Bible or some sort of um, devotional book. I like to use the lectionary to, to go through the whole Bible. Uh, but this year I'm doing a chronological read the Bible in one year plan. So I read a little bit from that some days, most days. And, but yeah, I think the main thing for me is uh, try to have some solitude and silence to start, to sort of start from there, listening from a posture of listening to God before I even start talking to God or, you know, just diving right into the day. Um, and the other thing, the other thing that came to mind, this is not necessarily uh, super spiritual, although it kind of is because it's all connected, but I try to drink a ton of water. Like I'm trying to drink a lot of water at the beginning of the day. And I find that's helpful for me to like, eat better and feel better and all that. So there's a couple thoughts. Great. Matt, what about you? How do you start your day? I am not a structured regimented person. I have a planner that has a startup routine. You know, it's supposed to guide you through every step by step, every, everything you do every single day. And I don't like to regiment my day too much in terms of, um, what we have going on around the house. I'm very subjective to what our house conditions are. And so Carrie has been getting up early and she's the first on the, uh, in the, in the workout area. And then I have to have Ian off to school at seven ten. So depending on how late I stayed up the night before, it depends on when I wake up. I'm trying to change that in June, fresh start, got up at six today. So that's my, uh, trying to get back into a rhythm. So my preferred wake up, is similar to Nathan. Before I get out of bed, I just try to have a moment of just contemplation and peace before I jump into anything. Um, I don't know if it's as much of a habit as it is a discipline. I always find myself as I wake up in the middle of the night, just having a check-in with God. <laughs> it's just like a, a quick little conversation of what's on my mind, helping me process my first thoughts. I'm always interested in what my first thoughts that naturally come in, kind of surrendering, aligning them to God. And so that's a typical habit. And then at some point in the morning, I want to have some kind of reading reflective time. It's important for me, but it just, right now, it just kind of, it might happen as soon as I wake up or it might happen after I drop Ian off. It may happen after I work out. And unfortunately, the quality has been determined by how much time I've allotted for. it. My preferred time is to wake up, have a little bit of that reflective time, go down, have a moment of reading, usually about 30 minutes, then do some exercise and then do whatever I want. Kids going to school, driving them has changed that dynamic here the past three or four months. So I'm looking forward to having a summer break with the kids at home Yeah, where that gives the flex it. But that's, I would say that I certainly agree with the author's perspective of how we start our day is very indicative of how we look at the entire day. Yeah. Our, our joy is, my personal joy is a lot of times connected to that rhythm of that startup. Exactly. exactly. The, the only other thing I, I should probably have said is like all of that the, probably the most important thing for me is to do some of those things that Matt and I both mentioned before getting on my phone. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I read the Bible on my phone or read a devotional off of my you know, Kindle app or whatever, but probably the worst thing I can do is just wake up and grab the phone and start you know, checking whatever. So mm -hmm. set that aside. And that's part of what, why the sol solitude and silence plays in. It's just um, be with God before before I really get back into zombie mode with my, um, with my smartphone, unfortunately that this, you know, how a lot of time goes, gets sucked away. Yeah. I didn't want to share this, but I will, because you brought it up. Clash of Clans and Clash Royale. Mm -hmm. They're two little games that my kids love to play. And I've been sitting around playing with them and it's been fun. I'm not going to blame them. And so it is a game built on covetous desires. <laughs> you are you are trying to get your virtual world better than your real world and you're part of a clan so there's peer pressure i mean it's just ridiculous what's it called it's called clash of clans and there's clash royale there's two different there's okay. two different modes of the gameplay and so um 
if I touch that thing in the morning, I'm done for 20 minutes. It's like a time suck. And so I, I called my buddy Greg today and said, it's gone. <laughs> so me and him deleted it. Nice. <laughs> the month of June. But it is funny. If you if you touch your phone, whether it's an email that demands your attention yeah. or a text message or anything, it just can rob you of that joy time in the morning. Yeah. I love the way both of you talked about silence. Uh, I wrote down some of the words you use, solitude, silence, peace, quiet. That is your desired way to start each day was to just find time just to sit still, which is almost the opposite of what the world's telling us that we should be doing, 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 (laughs) and doing over and over again. So that was great. The other word that that I was really intrigued with, Nathan, was you used the word posture. Um, that you want to be in the posture of being with God. Tell us a little bit more about that. What does that mean, the posture of being with God? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just, it's like what Dr. Kennison's saying. It's like how you start something often, you know, shapes the whole, the whole way that you view it and go about it. So, yeah, I think a posture of, uh, you know, just like um, remembering, you know, it's like the, the verse we've all heard, be still and know that I'm God. Like, rather than diving into my day, acting like I'm the, the ruler of it and the maker of it. Um, just first remembering who God is, where my place is in, in the big picture. And then that just shapes the way you, you, th- then you get busy and you do your, do your work and, you know, and, and um, nothing wrong with that. I love, I love to work hard, but uh, it just makes a huge difference if I'm working hard out of my own strength or if I have started with, it's just like you, um, you know, by posture, I guess, just meaning like the, the way that you look at the priority list, the, the sort of the attitude um, and priorities that you like take into the day. Yeah. That's so a mindset, not necessarily a physical body set. You posture better or anything like that. It's more about. Well, yes, that's, kind of, I think that's what I meant, but like, actually I do believe that, um, and, you know, I've learned a lot over the last few years about how our physical bodies and our, I mean, I think I, as Western enlightenment, post-enlightenment kind of like logical, you know, people, our culture, we tend to like compartmentalize things, but actually mind, body, spirit, you know, physical, emotional, relational, spiritual, mental, like uh, it's all very much mixed up and intertwined. And so I have learned, you know, I do think it, like, if you're going to sit and pray, if you're going to like lean back, you know, and half, you know, like whatever that it's very different than like kind of sitting up straight in a comfortable chair. And sometimes I like um, open my palms, you know, when I'm in that silent, I mean, again, I'm just, it's nothing like crazy, but if I'm going to sit in solitude and silence, sometimes I'll place my palms up and kind of open my hands to sort of like say, all right, God, like I'm here to receive what you have for me today. And, I, and I'm open. And I'm so, yeah, I do think physical posture actually is a, is a thing worth talking a lot about. Um, and I try to, to practice some of that as well. Great. Well, what well, the things that all that both of you, that you, both of you talked about, it's exciting for me to hear all of that because it isn't anything that everybody can't do, no matter how much money they make, no matter how busy they are during the day, no matter what they do for a living, uh, no matter how tall or short they are, it doesn't matter because everything you guys describe is what everybody can do. So that was really encouraging. I hope every all the listeners got as much encouragement out of it as I did because I did. Right. Um, so let's dive into this fruit thing. Um, So I've been intrigued over the last couple of weeks when we talk about the fruit being a singular fruit, like a peach. Um, So if we have this analogy of this one fruit um, and it's based on love, we learned last week how much love intertwines and pulls everything together, like going through the prism that Matt described. Um, So this whole idea of this, how does how does this one fruit concept help us understand how to have more joy in our life? So I can just envision if, all right, if just one fruit and it's, everything is made up of those, you know, eight components and love pulling it together in the pit. Um, so if we have a lot of joy today, but not too much kindness, does that mean there's a bruise where our kindness should be? I mean, how, how does it all balance out? How does joy become 
strong in that peach? <laughs> um, I mean, are we supposed to be balancing it all out? How, how does that work? So I'm going to let Matt start this because, because maybe you're like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to answer this one. <laughs> so we'll let Matt start this one. Yeah, let me start. Oh, we'll that's, great. that's great. No, um, I think it's funny that to concentrate, to me, it's similar that if you look at this list of of nine things and you're concentrating on one, you're trying to manufacture it probably inappropriately. To me, it's very similar to I'm staring at a plant and demanding a, a piece of fruit develop immediately. It's like, if I stare at you, here comes a strawberry, here it comes, <laughs> or sorry, I'll stick with the peach analogy. I'm staring at the tree, I'm, I'm massaging the tree and I'm thinking all of a sudden this peach is gonna appear you know, out of nowhere. Um, I like it to be identified by your fruit. And that's just helpful for me to just put all this in the perspective of these really are intertwined. You can see like you're going to be, if you're, if you are loving, <laughs> you're not loving if you're unkind. Right. And so you can see how these things fit together. Right. And so if you're at a peach tree and you're about to eat a thorn, you know, that's not fruit. That's not what that is. And so it's one of those identifiers of, I could give you nine reasons why you wouldn't need a peach, right? Um, it's rotten or it has those things you're talking about. And so you would say a healthy peach is described as these nine characteristics. And I think you would say that a healthy Christian walk has all of these elements. And you can see this connectedness to that. You can say which one of these things doesn't belong, unkindness. And it's like, no matter how loving it is, no matter how fuzzy it is, but if it has a big splotch of mold on it, you're like, nope, not edible. It's almost, uh, that's how I view that single fruit analogy. It's like, here are the nine things that make it edible. Any one of these things doesn't check out, throw the peach away. <laughs> it's not, it's not of God. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Good. I Go like ahead. that. I mean, like, um, you know, you don't want to push a the metaphor too too right. far or whatever but um i do i do think it's like so not every peach is going to be the same one of them the pit might be bigger or smaller the the size the color mm -hmm. but if it's if the color's a little different you know that, that's kind of makes me think of we're all we're all a little different in our mix of the these characteristics and where we're at and what what is stronger in me like i may be naturally more joyful but not as much whatever and Matt, you might be have a little different mix, but they all, like Matt said, they all need to be present. They all need to be growing. It's if it's fluorescent green and all the other stuff is there. I mean, it's it's not a peach, you know, or if it's whatever. So um, the thing I, that you make me think of is like, um, you know, I think one of the things, cool things I've learned and thought about recently is like when it comes to spiritual gifts. I think this fruit of the spirit thing is pretty clear. Like all, like we, like we've been teaching all these things need to be growing in you as evidence of the fruit of the spirit. We don't get to pick and choose in other parts of scripture where it's like spiritual gifts and these other things. I think it's the opposite. I think um, I can't remember who told me this one time, but uh, there's no such thing. You know, we're not really supposed to all be perfectly well-rounded individuals, the community, the body of Christ, we, we, we are weak where others are strong. We together become well-rounded. Um, and so that's kind of what I believe in terms of strengths and spiritual gifts and talents and all this, like none of us are going to be good at everything, but when it comes to the fruit of the spirit, it's a very different thing. It's, it's, um, we just don't get to pick and choose and we don't get to say, uh, that one, uh, I'm not really doing that one. It's yep. like, no, if the spirit, it, it and I love that fruit analogy. If the spirit is in you and growing in you, then this is the fruit. And here's the ways we describe that fruit. So, awesome. so we'll, we'll, we'll get away from the peach for a little while. I may come back to it at the end, but we'll, we'll move away from the peach. Um, you, you gave us a few things to do um, to help us reach that place of joy, to really go after it, to appreciate it when it's there. And you you linked it to being with kids and all of us can say that you hear a two-year-old giggle and you can't help but feel joy. Mm -hmm. uh, but you linked it to gratitude. Tell us a little bit more about how gratitude and just consciously choosing gratitude helps us connect to joy. 
Tell us a little bit more about that. So my uh, my pastor mentor uh, back back in the day, he used to have these like seven rules, like little things he learned over the years that he would teach over and over. And one of them was the secret to happiness is gratitude. And I, I like tweak it. I say the secret to contentment, okay, is gratitude. And um, I just really think that, you know, contentment, joy, hope, these are all concepts that really overlap a ton. And it's that, that part of, uh, that part of the Christian life, the spirit filled life, that's just very, uh, winsome to other people. That's very, um, resilient in the face of, you know, what changing circumstances of life. You want to talk about someone who's just content, someone who has shalom, you know, that, that, uh, deep abiding peace of God, someone who has joy, someone who has hope. And I, I just really believe that the, the, um, that that starts with gratitude. Like the, it's a, that's the fruit that comes from the seed that is maybe, maybe other things, but definitely a huge part of that is gratitude. It's, uh, it's taking a step back and look at setting aside all the, all the things I'm being constantly bombarded with advertisements that I, that I need, that I don't have, whether it's my body, my possessions, my accomplishments, whatever, setting all that aside and first saying, look at the gifts of God in my life. Look at the goodness of God in my life and count, it's just counting your blessings, naming them one by one, you know, and um, starting there. I just think it's the first step on the journey to finding this, you know, fruit, eventually growing in your life. Um, I don't know if I said anything new there at all, but it's just, it really is like gratitude is that is the beginning of that journey. It's the first step. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't think it can be restated enough. Um, it isn't something new to many of us that gratitude connects everything together, but it is something worth repeating over and over again. Um, uh, just uh, to go a little bit darker here, <laughs> there's a there's a verse in, uh, I wrote it down here, an Old Testament verse that says, though the fig tree does not blossom, so we're figs now, not peaches. Though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vine, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. <laughs> so I wrote down here, come on now. <laughs> so you have people that are just coming out of a pandemic, possibly were near the end of it in the U.S., but there's just a lot of stuff still going on related to that, but it's just the normal crap that happens. So you're telling me that we should have joy even in that kind of stuff. You, you talked about joy and sorrow being two sides of the same coin. I think that was really fascinating, but how does that all connect together? Suffering and sorrow and joy and how does it all connect to joy being that place that we want to be in? Tell us a little bit more about that. And Matt, please, you have a lot of experience with, with folks going through stuff. So please comment on, on this too. Go ahead, Nathan. Okay. And uh, Matt, I immediately think of, you know, Ian and, and your y'all's journey with cancer and all that. Um, but um, I'll say a couple words. Uh, so <laughs> like, I, yeah, it, I think the longer we live and the more we're able to reflect and just observe what is true about life, the more we see that the, the best and the worst things often kind of come from the same place, often kind of like, uh, it really is like sort of this duality. Um, so like joy and sorrow, they're both, those are both like deep and real things. So if we want to just like ignore and pretend, then we can get into happiness and, can, you know, just kind of like circumstances going our way. But when we're living real life, often the deep things, both difficult and, you know, both dark and light are just right up next to each other. Right. Um, so uh, I just think the more life experience we have, the more we begin to see that stuff. And it's the, you know, it's from the greatest sorrows and the greatest challenges that we really get to experience. Like if, if, every, if everything's always fine, you don't really get to taste the saving grace of God and the deep love of God. And if there's no death, there's no need for resurrection and that kind of thing. So 
Um, you know, you, you mentioned like the, uh, seriously, we're supposed to rejoice when things are awful and, and coming out of COVID and, and just everything that's been going on in the last few years. I think it was Rick Warren that said in the next few years, there's going to be a tidal wave of grief, uh, in this country. And I agree. Um, and so we're going to need the joy of the Lord even more, but it just, it's just a biblical thing. I mean, it's, um, if you look at the Psalms, you know, study, I would say, uh, I think in your email, you were like, what, give people some guidance on, on this kind of concept of joy in hard times. It's like, uh, do a study of Philippians. I mentioned that in the sermon, the letter of joy, also the letter of sorrow and, uh, written from prison cell and, Paul's holding those things very closely together. Read the Psalms, the ancient prayers of God's people. And particularly there's um, a lot of them that are called Psalms of lament, which is like pouring out, you know, sadness. And, um, and what you'll notice is a lot of the times the Psalms are just saying, God, you know, this is terrible. Where are you? Uh, have you forgotten us? These kinds of things. And that's honest. We can say those kinds of things to God, but there's always the turn where people, where the psalmist and the kind of the people God come back around to, and yet we will still praise you. And that is our faith. That is what we do. And I always, when I think about that, I also always think about John chapter six when the disciples, when Jesus says some really hard things about what it means to follow him. And all these people are like, oh, okay, then we're out and they leave. And Jesus looks at his, his closest followers and says, you guys going to leave too? And they say, where else are we going to go? You have the words of life. You have the words of eternal life. And that's kind of where I've found myself in the hardest times in my life. It's like, what are the other options here? And I've never found anything remotely as good as the gospel, you know, the good news uh, of Jesus and resurrection hope. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I answered your question at all. You did. You did. And more. Matt. Yeah. I think, you know, you mentioned Ian's cancer update. He's 15 today. So that's just a, a special praise right there. You know, he had a pretty bad diagnosis of three and a half. And I, I think two, two things that really stood out, you know, at first everyone has, kind of has that mindset, why us, why me, why this happen? And then we really looked at the statistics of how many kids would have cancer, and it's like 15,000. It's not a high number of people in the United States that have children with pediatric cancer. And so the question became kind of shifted to why not me? Like, you know, would I expect an exemption clause because of God that I shouldn't have hardship? And that's certainly not a biblical perspective. Um, you know, in the book that we're reading, they did such a great job of outlining all the times the disciples faced hardship, when Paul faced hardship and imprisonment, persecution, and were flogged. And they made it a big point. It's not that they're celebrating their hardships. They're not saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I have cancer. It's nothing like that. It's I have something stronger than this thing that I'm facing, and that is God. And ultimately, I believe we can almost find ourselves, I have found in a long time, I couldn't wait for heaven. And then everything in this world became very dark. Um, or what's the, what's the use? It's like, let's just get this life over with so we can get to the next place where the good stuff happens. And it takes a reminder that God has work for us to do to bring that recreation work here. Now it's the here and now it's the in-between and Nathan could go off and I love hearing him talk about heaven on earth and, and those perspectives, but we have a responsibility of bringing heaven to earth. And what this book has again and again strive for us to understand is the communal aspect of each of these levels of fruit and how the church can bring this together. And that was one of the most beautiful things of watching how folks joined us on our journey with Ian. And it, it wasn't just our journey. You know, the church came around and it was a, it was a journey we were taking together. We celebrated wins, we grieved losses together. And being able to see that level of joy, as Nathan described, the high times and the low times, and realizing that not only is God's presence with us, but an authentic community of people gathered around, and which times Nathan was able to be in that, in that space with us. So I would say that 
the corporate gathering allows you to appropriately grieve when something's hard and yet still have joy in that because you're collectively knowing that God has the strength and power to sustain you in that hard season, yet also a future void of this current pain and hardship and tears is promised. And so you, the community helps you live in that in-between space where you can't wait till it's over, but they help you endure it. And you know, something's better around the corner. So coming out of coming out of the pandemic, like we have, um, it just, uh, the community was important and we've learned how to connect as a community, even though we can't be together together. So for both of you, um, when there are times when you can't be in the community, you use the example, Nathan, of, you know, rubbing up against people who have joy and you'll get joy. Well, what if you can't? Mm -hmm. What if you're alone and you just got off the Zoom call that lasted 48 minutes and now you're alone again? Well, what do you do then? Where, where do you guys go to get filled up when you were in isolation just as much as as the people that you serve with and that you minister to were as well. So talk a little bit about um, that rejoicing, the, the rejoicing thing that you talked about, which I thought was so wise. Mm. Um, and then we'll close out. Go ahead. Me? You want me to go? Yeah, sure. Um, well, for, the first thing I thought of with this question was, and uh, actually was thank God for FaceTime and Zoom. Uh, because... You know, yes, I know a lot of us have Zoom fatigue and rightly so, right? I mean, it's and it's certainly not the same. That's not even close to the same as being together. But gosh, it's so much better than just voice calls or whatever. Like, and we've spent most of our life together, Aaron and I. Um, we we love family, we're really close to our families, and but God's call in our life has led us to live far away from our family most most all the time. And that kind of, again, this, this joy and sorrow thing, we have a lot of joy from the ministry life that we've had. And my heart kind of breaks every day for 20 years for how far I am from my grandparents and my parents and my brother and his kids and all that. And it's just, those are both true. And um, so I thank God for FaceTime and Zoom because they connect us in ways that, um, that we couldn't otherwise. And, you know, so, uh, there's that there's, um, another thing that comes to mind right away is, is, um, you know, we, we, as we kind of gave all that over to God and said, okay, we're supposed to, we believe we're supposed to move to Mexico or believe we're supposed to move to Maryland. And that's not where our family is. Um, we're trusting you with that God. One of the things we found was that God, um, kind of trade, we kind of traded, and, and this is God doing this. We didn't see this ahead of time, but sort of we're able to trade quantity for quality in a lot of those key relationships. And yes, we didn't see like our parents as, as often, but when we were together, it was 24 seven for a week or whatever. It was intentional. It was, we were more appreciative of it. We're more like intentional with what, how we use the time um, and our relationships actually continue to grow deeper um, and with a lot of our family and, and closest friends. So um, even if you can't get together as often or, or in ways that you prefer, when you do uh, be intentional with it, pray over it before, during and after, take advantage and treasure it, you know, and God can. I think God created the concept of time. So God stands above and outside of that. So God can do amazing things with even with infrequent, but um, intentional um, time together. Uh, you know, and then just find, I thought about um, the rejoicing thing, like just find what touches your heart deeply. Um, and like, uh, I, this is not meant to be a criticism, but like, 99.9% .9 of contemporary Christian music does, I don't, it doesn't do it for me. Okay. But I love music. So for me, it's, it's you two, it's need to breathe. It's Johnny cash. It's um, this guy, David Ramirez, it's explosions in the sky. I, there are certain bands and certain musicians, some of whom don't even necessarily call themselves Christians 
that take me to the, a place with God in my car, in my house, in my headphones. So figure that out for you and don't forget the, the mold, the peer pressure. And then, and then sometimes I do need to listen, whether it's my favorite songs in the world or not. I listen to praise songs and worship songs. Every Sunday we have a playlist at our house and we don't listen to any other music that day. We just listen to Jesus songs all the time, all the time on Sunday. I don't know. Find out that those little patterns in, in your life and your family that can um, put you in a place of rejoicing. And what, maybe it's not music. Maybe it's other forms of art. Maybe it's nature. You know, when's the last time you saw a sunrise or a sunset? Maybe that's your place where you can really rejoice. Um, connect with God however you can. And then just the classical spiritual practices, spiritual disciplines. It's really, we really don't have to reinvent the wheel a lot of this stuff, but it's Solitude and silence, prayer, study the Bible, uh, Sabbath rest, fasting, retreat, exercise, you know, these types of things, Ser serving other people. So there's a few thoughts on that. Even in, even in a pandemic, even if you're isolated, um, how to kind of continue to rejoice. Beautiful. Beautiful. You should write all that down in a book. <laughs> yeah. You have any final thoughts on that, on rejoicing? Yeah, I, I believe that there is just so much. I, I appreciate what Nathan was saying, obviously, some very practical things. I just think it's important to recognize we, have, we are relational creatures. We are having joy with a relational God who wants to be in relationship with us. These aren't tasks to be completed. These aren't checklists to appease this vengeful, pursuant God who wants to make sure we're doing what we're doing and investigating everything, but the idea of a joyful relationship. I think back to what Nathan was saying earlier about, um, you know, before grabbing your phone or posture, that was the conversation posture, the posture in which we read scripture. Sometimes you read scripture because it's a good discipline and you want to get through it. You know, you're like, okay, I'm reading the book in the Bible in a year and all right, I'm going to do it while I'm walking and I might not be hundred percent in it, but I'm, I'm checking this practice off. But if it becomes a check, check off and not a time to connect with God, only our hearts know and our, you know, our hearts and our minds understand what we're actually trying to do. Yeah. Uh, when I think posture, it makes me think of the way I connect with Carrie as a, just a good example. There are times when we're intentionally looking at each other in the eyes because there is a, a serious conversation that has to happen. There are times when we are just driving down the road and those are just great conversations and we're laughing and we're having this great time. We're side by side. And there's times when we're just kind of checking in, you know, we're like, multitasking. Hey, everything good. Yeah, everything's good. And boom. And to think through those postures with God, there should be times when we are 100% focused because we need his attention and need to trust that he has ours. And then there's other times where we're just checking in. So I think those postures are helpful to that. And when you mentioned pandemic and physical relationships, I think it's the same thing. There are times when we need someone in the room with us and we have to be vulnerable enough to say, dude, this demands more than a Zoom call, more than a phone call. I've got to have an hour or two with you because I'm really hurting and I, I'm in a hard spot. Vulnerable, it's necessary, but I think that posture is needed in, in certain quarantine moments. Mm. And then if we don't have that individual, I would just say there's too much time when we think I can't achieve this or too much time has passed or I blew it. The mindset that our spot is fixed or I don't have relationships like that, so I'm going to tread on and do life alone. It's just foolish that... There is an element of change. There is a moment that God can inspire us and bring these fruits to life in us, regardless of how barren the plant looks, no matter how hard the soil looks. Mm -hmm. It'd be a little bit more difficult I, to brittle up, but yeah, life can I, grow. I think that's so good. I have a group of guys from college and seminary that um, we, we just have committed to get together once a year and just get really real and talk about life and the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it's like, I mean, we, most all of us are married kids. It's hard. It's expensive, especially for me. I'm the one that's like far away, you know, and, but it's just worth it, you know? And so like one of the things my, uh, one of my other mentors used to always teach us, he drove home. It's just like weddings and funerals, weddings and funerals, like just when in doubt, go be there, show up, make the trip, make the investment. And, this kind of what Matt's bringing to mind with this, like, um, just do it, like go, go be with people when you can, you can't always do it. 
but and sometimes I just get to thinking like, uh, I don't know, it's not worth it anymore. Like, I'm not going to invest in new friendships. And, or maybe you hear me say, oh, I got this group of guys and, and you're like, well, I don't have that. So you're like, you know, way ahead of me on the like what I can't. Can I start that now? And it's just like like Matt saying, like, yeah, like um, what's the old saying? When's the best time to plant a tree? 50 years ago. <laughs> But when's the second best time to plant a tree right now? Yep. So just start now and uh, do what you can to invest in meaningful relationships that encourage you. And a part of a big part of that is like church, just being a part of a community that you're like, we're all weirdos and it's frustrating sometimes. And, you know, like it's not convenient always, but that's what church is. It's like this, I'm saying I'm going to, commit to a group of people and they're going to commit to me and we're going to be there for each other. You know, yeah. Diane, I got one other thing before you wrap up. This is almost it's a whole nother section. It doesn't have to be now, but I will say that one thing in the book that he really did a good job of talking about is advertising and materialism. How one of the biggest ways of brewing up discontentment or zapping our joy is to, marketing shows us things that we didn't know we need until we subject ourselves to the marketing. And uh, sometimes you always want to keep up to the Joneses. And so Nathan, I thought it'd be good for you to talk about mm. your post about your, uh, your Jetta. Oh, well, wait, remind me. You just did a post the other day about your all black Jetta and <laughs> how many miles. And then you had oh, a great yeah. caption on there. I'm trying to remember what I've said. I, I drive a 2004 Volkswagen Jetta TDI. I love it. I'm so proud. Like it, for me, it's like a point of pride yeah. to make my cars last as long as they can. And uh, that's partly that's like a, you know, a financial thing, but partly it's just, it's one little way that I can say, kind of push back against one of those kind of materialistic sort of assumptions like, oh, we all got to have new cars every few years or whatever. We all got to, one of the ways that I do that is like, I love my little 2004 car and I'm trying to drive it half a million miles or whatever. So I don't even remember what specifically I said, man, <laughs> that you're referring to, but I, I love, uh, her name is Sally. Yep. Uh, because the people I bought that car from, they were like, they were like, I don't know if you name your cars, but if you do, this one already has a name. Her name is Sally. Don't change your name. I was like, okay, her name is Sally. So um, anyway, yeah, that, I, I just, I'm so, that's one thing that I didn't, uh, I couldn't fit in, didn't get to yep. really hit in the sermon. So I'm really glad you bring that up, Matt. Uh, Dr. Kennison does such a great job. And that is, we are, and what's the Netflix thing about social media? Yeah. Guys, social dilemma. The social yeah. dilemma. Everybody watch that if you haven't yet. We are constantly bombarded from a million different angles with we're targeted to, you know, people are trying to sell everything to us. And one of the things about like, for example, social media or clash of clans or whatever it may be, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Yep. And so they're, they're you know, so that's just a really good word. One of the best. And it goes right back to the gratitude thing. Mm hmm. If you're constantly thinking about what you don't have, what you need, what's not enough in your life, you're not thinking about why what you have is, is enough and, and it's contentment versus the opposite. And yeah, that's a really, really good point that needs to be made on this, yeah. on this topic for sure. And he did a great job. I thought he said, and I, I might misquote him, but it was desire is a great emotion as long as you're desiring the correct thing. Yeah. And that desire for God and that wholeness. And we see that alive. And one of the best analogies he gave, and this is obviously difficult for someone who doesn't have a child or is trying to have a child, but one of the analogies he gave of the joy, the reciprocal joy, and how could a God who has everything take joy in creation choosing to be with him? And he likened it to as he pulls up after work and he would see his daughters peek their heads out the window and see him coming and to be all excited and then when he reached the door, they just, you know, basically tapped him with hugs and, and yelled mm -hmm. out for him. And he says the joy he felt in experiencing their joy gave the full circle nature. And I, I just think that's such a beautiful image. Um, 
one of the other challenges he said is to read outside of our cult, our current culture and to find how other Christians, non-American Christians or outside our whole English speaking narrative that we're able to create is we've lost imagination. So he says, if you get into the mindset of someone else who had joy in God, despite hardship, then that gives us an, a view into another reality of joy. And uh, one of the things I looked at was the story behind how great the art is. And uh, Diane, maybe you can show that in the notes. It was a song 21 years in the writing, mm-hmm. like 30 years after a poem was written. Uh-huh. And you get to watch this guy's journey. Um, one, the original poet, he was walking through the woods, got caught in a immense thunderstorm. I mean, just powerful lightning on the horizon. He ran into an abandoned farmhouse. He watched it and just journaled down some thoughts. And then as quickly as the storm came in, it ended. He walked back to his home and he was reflecting on it and heard church bells ringing and he just pounded out, I think it was eight stanzas Mm -hmm. of this poem. Poem starts circulating. And then a gospel writer, uh, a gospel preacher found it and said he wanted to put it to a tune. In over 21 years, he had written one stanza at a time as he experienced these powerful life circumstances. And just, I'll put the YouTube link. I'll send it to you, Diane, to put in there. Right. But just an opportunity to see how something so powerful has unfolded and to hear the words, how great thou art from that author's perspective when he was hiking. And as he saw these parts of nature, took me back to nature does speak to me. Mm-hmm. Being in the woods, seeing God's creative hand and watching Ian Friday night, get home from work. And it's just, up, it was pouring rain and there was a toad out in the, in the driveway. And he's like, there's a toad. Here, hold this so I can touch it. So, you know, he goes down. He, he's a city kid. He doesn't know what to do. He's like, he's like kind of poking. What do I do, Dad? I'm like, you grab it. <laughs> like you scoop it up and you hold it in your hands like this and you kind of pet it. <laughs> so he was jumping out of his hand. But that's joy watching him discover a creature. That's pretty awkward. <laughs> I, got, I got one more resource for you. Okay. I found this, to bring it full circle, I found this thing last year from a targeted ad on Instagram. I know you. I called, you the, it. called the peach truck. And it's these people that get fresh Georgia peaches and you can program. They, they're going to, they show up at certain places all around the country at certain times and deliver you like whatever you order. Now. And we, yeah. And we got like a big crate of them last year and just ate them until they were coming out our ears and it was the best thing about summer last year it was wonderful I this <laughs> like tons of these and they were really good and so um yeah we're doing it again this year getting a bunch That's of cool i'm gonna i'll pick them up right down the road here in indiana oh man they better <laughs> have it in pennsylvania i bet they do all right i'm checking do. it out the peach truck yeah, check them out. I'll put it in. I'll put it in our resources so everybody can <laughs> get this peach truck and become multimillionaires <laughs> off of our podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo. Woo. <laughs> that's a, that's a we done question. good. We done good for God. Okay. Uh, well, got to bring it to a close eventually. So I want to thank Nathan for joining us. Really, um, my pleasure, guys. With everything that's going on in the world and with kids and with your life and everything, for you to take another hour, it's just awesome. Thank you so much. We covered a lot, everything from peaches to Sally the car to the peach truck, but uh, more important was um, the notes I took. Yeah, my my notes are very important, but (laughs) one of the things that I wrote down and circled was that God uses it all. God just used everything you guys said was what came back to that. God uses it all, the bad, the good, the sorrow, the joy. He uses it all for good. He uses time for good. Uh, reaching out when it's difficult he uses for good whether it works out or not he uses it for good so we can rely on that so thank you so much gentlemen um tune in next week we'll be covering peace 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 peace, brother peace i just watched a documentary on 1971 and what the music meant to the generation my generation oh yeah good music good music but the background to it not so good. <laughs> a lot of drugs yeah. there. But anyway, uh, thanks so much. Next week will be peace. Uh, if you check below. Uh, if you're watching, you'll see the resources there. Um, and if you're not watching it online, then you can jump on our Facebook page and the resources will be listed there as well. So, And there's going to be a lot of them this time, including the peach truck. 
So have a great week, everybody. Talk to you next week. Bye. Bye.